Thank you, Anna. Lovely welcome. Great to be back in beautiful Warsaw. It's much warmer this time than it was when I was here last. It was very, very cold. Um, I've been many times and it's always nice to be here. So Jude and I are going to do a little bit of a walkthrough of the background and the context to the study and the project that we've been involved in. So thank you to our lovely hosts here at Maria Grosska University in Poland. That's the best I can do, sorry. It sounds like we're going to do a little bit of a karaoke. So this is me here. I've been involved in the Erasmus Plus projects for nearly 15 years. And we're going to talk about, I think it's the fourth one that we've done. And um, really interesting. But I want to contextualize the work that we have done and think globally about children and young adults with intellectual disabilities these young people that we are particularly concerned about, but they're a subpopulation of the global population. So just broadly, European Union, 74, three quarters of a billion people. And we, we were thinking when we were planning this project about these children and young adults with very complex neurodevelopmental issues. And what were some of the challenges that were facing them and their families, people within education, in social care and in health care. So the populations of the countries that were involved in this project, we have lovely Norway there and we have Rolf Magnus somewhere here. So just under 5 million people in Norway, Sweden about 10 million people, Romania 21 million, England huge 51 million, Northern Ireland where I'm from very small, the smallest just under 2 million, Scotland 5 million, and then you add all them together and you think, well, what is it like for children and young adults with intellectual disabilities living in Norway, Sweden, Romania, Poland, England, Wales? That was what we were interested in. And what do these populations look like? So we were interested in life expectancy. And I found this slide and it's fascinating. So globally, 250 years ago, roughly, your life expectancy in 1800 was 31 years. And then you see life events like famine, the Spanish flu 120 years ago. We've just lived through a global pandemic. Poland massively affected by the Second World War. And then you go forward about 200 years and you can see that life expectancy has more than doubled. So what does that mean for children and adults with intellectual disabilities? Well, we know that, for example, children with Down syndrome very common intellectual disability. Around 1900, their life expectancy was 10 years old. So we didn't see many people with Down syndrome 125 years ago living into adulthood, but this situation has changed dramatically. And it was that context that we were particularly interested in. We're interested in life expectancy. So if you look across the EU, over nearly a 25 year period, you can see that life expectancy for males and females has gone up markedly, a slight dip in the past couple of years, but life expectancy has gone up by about eight to 10 years over a 20 year period. So we were interested, well, what does that mean for children and young people with intellectual disabilities as a subpopulation of the general population. So these were some of the questions when we were planning this project that we were interested in and what did this mean? And here you can see that there's projected population changes. So some countries like Scotland, where Sam is from, they're gonna have a decreasing, a decreasing general population. But Ireland, for example, where I am, has an increasing, an increasing population. And you'll see uh, other countries there, Sweden, um, and, and England and others who've been a part of our project. So what does this mean? If life expectancy is increasing, if populations are increasing, what does this mean for intellectual and developmental disabilities? Our governments across the EU on a global basis, as populations age, the things that they are really concerned about is cancer, which tends to affect older people, Coronary heart disease, particularly common due to diet, poor exercise and things like that. And this then can lead to strokes to increase blood, blood, um, uh, blood pressure issues. So governments understandably, from a social policy point of view, from a health policy point of view, all the countries where we are, our governments are concerned with these issues and understandably so. But we're thinking, well, how does these issues then affect children and young adults with intellectual disabilities. 
So what do we know? The research evidence on a global basis, and many of you here, I understand, work in special education. So this will be your core role. We're seeing increasing complexity of children and young adults with intellectual disabilities surviving into older age. But older age is still 30 to 40 years shorter than people in the general population. So if we go back to one of the slides earlier, life expectancy on average across the EU is about 82 to 85 years. But this means that for children and adults with intellectual and developmental issues, it will be 30 to 40 years shorter. We're seeing increasing scientific advances in recognising rare syndromes. All these rare genetic syndromes where there may be half a dozen of them in Poland, and a hundred of them across the EU. They have specific learning profiles, specific learning needs, specific support needs. We're seeing increasing numbers of autism spectrum disorder children, children with ADHD, fetal alcohol spectrum, and a range of neuropsychiatric issues. So this is the complexity that we were interested in. As researchers and educators, we were looking at the research evidence of this growing and changing population of children and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Within this wider context, all our countries had signed up to the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disability, and we were interested, well, what does this mean for children, adults, and older people with intellectual disabilities within a wider population of people with people with all kinds of disabilities, whether it be sensory impairments, physical disability, mental impairments. We were interested in children and young adults with intellectual and developmental uh, um, issues. So across the EU member states, this uh, convention has been widely adopted and it helps set the context for some of the challenges that we set ourselves regarding the social inclusion of these children and young adults with very complex needs. So what do we know? The evidence is that the vast majority of these children and young adults are cared for at home. In some countries there have been slight blips where there was institutions and all sorts of different things happened, but historically by and large families want to care for their family member with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We know because of their education needs their health needs, their social care needs, their respite needs, their high and frequent users of education services, often special education, health services and social care, that they're living longer, many of them with multiple physical, mental health and behavioural complex needs, and that these conditions that they present with and their learning needs will be life lifelong. And that we're also seeing a population of children and young adults with very complex physical health needs where interventions and technological support is required to sustain life. And I've worked with school teachers who've said that the classroom is becoming like a mini hospital and a mini intensive care because of the complexity of some of the children. And we know that these needs are, are layered. So all the children have education needs. Some of them will be special education needs with behavioural support needs. They will need to ask, access primary care services, paediatric services, emergency department services, social care services, respite services. So what we were interested in in this project that we're going to share with you was how do we, as professionals who work in education, health care and social care, how do we plan and coordinate care and support now and in the future? And how do we draw on all our knowledge and skills and expertise to ensure that we're trying to support the inclusion and ordinary lives of these children and young adults, particularly those with very, very complex care needs? So what we're seeing is preterm neonates who previously would have died, maybe about 20 weeks, a normal gestation, as people will know, is about 38 to 40 weeks. So we're seeing severe prematurity, interventions to sustain life, severe physical disabilities, cerebral palsy, blindness, hearing impairments, epilepsy, gastrointestinal issues. This is what some of you who work in education and healthcare will be seeing as your everyday work role. Children with very complex needs, 
uh, growing needs that require family-centered supports and supports from education and other services. The other issue that we're seeing for these preterm babies is behavioral, emotional, and psychiatric issues commonly. So we're seeing issues like fetal alcohol spectrum issues linked with ADHD, often of the inattention kind, emotional problems, ASD, increased risk of anxiety disorders and depression, impulsivity, issues like this. So this is what's coming into the classroom if you're special education teachers. And this is the context of our study and the work that we did. We were interested in how we promote social inclusion for children with very complex needs because we recognized that the picture across all our countries was one sometimes of social exclusion. So this is what we were concerned about. So I'm now gonna hand over to my colleague, Dr. Ta. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Brown for setting up the context and giving you some backgrounds on the kind of issues that we grappled with in terms of planning and formulating uh, the project. Uh, we, as Micah mentioned earlier, we've worked together almost 15 years when we first met and decided that we like each other that much and we want to collaborate and still like each other and we've been doing that all these years. And this is actually the fourth project that we have uh, implemented together. Uh, I will basically focus on this, the last project, which is in line with the, this conference that we're having today. And based on all these different issues that Michael uh, just mentioned, we thought, how do we address this particular problem in terms of bringing together people from different disciplines and professional groups uh, to try to see how we can uh, uh, enable and facilitate social inclusion and participation for these children and young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, based on that and the initial projects that we've done together, so we thought this would be a logical progression in our consortium and the work in the consortium uh, to grapple with this particular issue. We had looked at inclusion uh, before in other projects, but then we are more focused on looking at uh, inclusion, social inclusion, broadening up a little bit, and social participation for this particular group. But in terms of how we could do that uh, through interprofessional practice or approach. And we basically had two different ways we thought about that. That could happen through practice, but then we also thought it's as important to develop some kind of interprofessional, interprofessional education, such that we reunite uh, students from all different these disciplines that we work with to come together at some point and study together and try to see how we could coordinate in terms of sharing knowledge and practices pre-professional uh, when they are still studying at the university. So we thought that would be a good way to go in terms of building and sustaining this interprofessional collaboration to support the social inclusion and participation of children and young people with ID. Yeah, so these different challenges of today are also challenges of tomorrow. And uh, in action today would have devastating effects on their social inclusion. So we were more interested in a, a solution-based approach to uh, dealing with this issue. And it was about how do we remove the barriers to social inclusion and participation uh, for these children and young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And that became also the, the, the title of the project that we uh, planned together, wrote the application, submitted, and got funded uh, for a three years project uh, addressing these different issues. But what actually were we looking at and interested in knowing? Michael talked about the partnership and as well as um, uh, Professor uh, Anna Odrowa's quotes. quotes. <laughs> yeah, we have problems uh, pronouncing Polish words but we'll try and we've been working the last how many years today? Yeah, and we still have difficulties with that. But these are the universities that participated in the, in the project which phased out uh, last year and all the project partners are represented here today and we'll get the chance to, for you to get to meet and talk to them uh, during dinner and in other kind of informal uh, uh, breaks or coffee breaks that we'll have. So what did we actually do within the framework of uh, this project, the removal of barriers to social inclusion and participation? 
were mainly focused on three primary goals, and that was the development of what we call an interprofessional curriculum resource, and that resource was to put together uh, different kinds of uh, knowledge and information, both literature, but other kind of relevant uh, information that could be used by higher education institutions, but other kind of organizations in terms of developing uh, educational curricula that could be uh, uh, delivered to students or other group of individuals that work with and support children with intellectual disabilities. So we wanted to make that an open resource that people could access and uh, find different kind of resources. Then we're also interested in uh, producing some scientific articles as well. We all work within uh, academia and research is an integral part of our work. So, but then it's also a way of producing and disseminating uh, relevant knowledge within the subject area. Uh, and then based on the fact that we wanted this uh, education, joint education and shared learning between students from all the participating institutions. So we also decided to implement, uh, implement what we call an interprofessional intensive course. So this is a course that will bring together students from all different universities within the different disciplines and they will meet together. We will meet together in one of the partner universities for a period of two weeks where we will deliver a 7.5 credit course. And in that students would work not only internationally but across professions. So we designed the course uh, taking in mind the need for collaboration and the need for them to uh, uh, discuss and share knowledge and practices as well as identifying priority areas within their different profession in terms of how they could collaborate uh, to provide effective services and support the social inclusion of the children and young uh, persons with or young adults with intellectual disabilities. So those were the three main things that we, we, we did in the implementation phase of the project, which uh, lasted until 2022. I will talk a little bit more about uh, those uh, three different things here. I will start first with the interprofessional intensive course. And we, the initial plan was that we would have three of these different courses in three of our partner universities. The first year was in 20, 2020 in Oradia, and that was the onset of the, the COVID. So we were actually, the first week of having the, the IP, the intensive program, uh, then the pandemic kind of became of global and uh, interest and boundaries were closing, so we had to evacuate all the students from Oradia back to their different countries as well as the teachers, which was rather unfortunate, but we had the first part of the intensive program on campus at the University of Oradia, and we later on uh, trans migrated it online. I think we were one of the first to actually do that because we sent back students two days after we had online uh, teaching to continue and uh, delivering the delivering of the delivering of the course. So, uh, 2021, the course was supposed to actually hold the year at the university. Unfortunately, due to pandemic and all the different restrictions, we couldn't have that uh, course. But the last one held in Belfast, was it right? Oh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh was it in 2022? So we still had students from all our different universities. In total, we had 147 students who participated in the two intensive programs that were organized, and all of them completed the course and were delivered 7.5 uh, uh, credits at their different universities. So it was a very big uh, success, it, not, it, not just at the level of students and student knowledge, but also the exchange between us teachers. We had other teachers who are unfortunately not able to be here today, but we had rich discussions and a lot of exchange of ideas and practices across the different countries in a, in a bit to how to identify ways of how to support social inclusion rather than seeing what necessarily comparing countries and seeing which is better than the other. So it was a shared learning exercise. And the students were very happy and there from the feedback we received from students, most of them were very explicit that it was the best experience in their lives ever. And just a little bit of an act, an doc, that it, uh, I, for those of you who are so interested in current affairs, a few years ago we had uh, an incident with uh, 
a self-bombing incident in the center of Stockholm a few years ago. And actually, the student that was on the picture on all international media was one of the students from Edinburgh, it was Sam right? So who came to Stockholm to visit the Swedish students after they, 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 they met during the delivery of the course. So the course kind of not only developed their, their professional competence and professional knowledge, but also led to very strong social relationships such that they had maintained that even after the course was over. So at that level, it was both successful in terms of knowledge exchange, but as well as uh, developing social and uh, sustainable social relationship between students and teachers. But uh, we also, within the framework of the project, uh, produced a couple of scientific works as well, which you could see. And these are available as open resources on our project website on the open uh, educational resource. So if you are interested, you, you can have a look and read some of them. I think they will be very useful in terms of the work we are doing today with social inclusion for children and young people with intellectual disabilities. Lastly, but not the least, as promised in the project application, we also delivered on the open online resource, which is also there and useful for all of us, both students and practitioners students, practitioners, and so, as well as academics within uh, the area of disabilities, especially IVD and social inclusion. There's a lot of information and material there that uh, you can uh, uh, have a look and it may be relevant in the kind of work that you do, both as students as well as academics in when we develop different kind of curricula that would be responsive to the need of social inclusion and participation. Uh, that's the website there. So, and you find the articles there and many other things that we've done within the project. So in, that was in a nutshell what we have been trying to do, uh, or we have done actually the last uh, uh, four years. The project phased out last year. We submitted the project final report, which was approved. And then we have continued with some dis dissemination uh, activities. And we had one last uh, two years ago in June in Belfast. That's a beautiful you know, campus of the Uni Queen's University in Belfast. So I fancy where Michael works and where he sits and does no, his I private work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we had the conference at least in that building, so it was it was really beautiful. So yeah, so that was just in a nutshell uh, what we have done, and we will continue working on that. And we invite some of you who are interested as well in this issue, we think you are because you are here sitting with us today, that we would also be, be very welcoming and open to having reflections and discussions with you for future collaboration. So thank you very much. So you can keep one and one. So any questions to our professors? No. Now, in this case, thank you very much indeed. One more round. Of